everybody. Welcome to Gold Dunkers Live, uh, another episode here. I am your host, Kendall Shell, and we have the pleasure of having one of my former teammates, uh, former Golden Gopher, uh, Joey King, on the show today. What's up, Joey? What's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Yes, for sure, for sure. So uh, everybody that's already tuned in, I can see it looks like a couple people have joined already. Um, thanks for joining, and everybody that's going to be listening back, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, today we're just going to chat a little bit about Joey, about what's been going on with him, a little bit about some gopher things, uh, and just all things hoops. Anybody listening right now, as always, you can chat Facebook, any platform you're using, you can chat live, and uh, if there's any questions, I can ask those as well. Um, so just to get going, just to get started, Joey, how's things been going? Um, how are things during this quarantine time? I mean, first, before we even get started, uh, what's been going on with you? How have you been handling quarantine and what's life been like? Hey, uh, you know, it's been good here. Uh, you know, my wife and I ended up getting a house uh, shortly after we got married out in Chanhassen. So I'm uh, about a mile and a half south of Maynard's gives me a, a great opportunity to go ahead and order takeout as, as much as we need to. Oh, uh, so definitely, yeah, definitely, definitely crushing the poke bowls and the and the and the burgers from there. It's delicious. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's been good. Uh, we're we're just quarantining to the best of our ability, I suppose. Obviously, it's weird uh, not being able to play any basketball this time of year. Um, but my but my other job, uh, you know, working with international feed uh, out here in Navarre has has been uh, considered a you know, essential business. So we're rocking and rolling as we, as we normally would. So uh, I feel really fortunate. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, anybody that doesn't know, yeah. Tell them a little bit about what's been going on with you uh, in life outside of basketball, as well as life uh, in basketball, some of the training stuff you've been up to, some of the things uh, you've been partaking uh, over the last year or so. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, I've kind of got three things going on. Uh, obviously, like I mentioned previously, uh, I work with a, a trading company based out of Navarre. Um, we, we sell agricultural ingredients, uh, different uh, animal feed products to Southeast Asia, the Middle East. And uh, we export those in containers around the world. And we have a lot of fun doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. I work with a great group of people. And then uh, it gives me the flexibility to play basketball around the world. Uh, I play with a group called FIBA 3X3 uh, with okay. a team called New York Harlem based out of New York. So uh, I traveled to New York for a couple of days, practice with the guys and then uh, take trips to Asia from about May until November uh, playing in different tournaments around the world. So uh, I definitely have a lot of fun with that and uh, it, it keeps me involved in the game and I really enjoy it. And then obviously uh, I suppose part three would be uh, training kids and hosting camps throughout the summer Obviously, uh, during my time with the Gophers, it, it gave me a lot of opportunities uh, to volunteer and, and help kids uh, around the metro area. And now that I live out in the West Metro, I like to uh, give back as much as I can and, and work with, with a lot of kids in the Waconia, Mayor, uh, Chanhassen area and uh, try and, uh, I guess, teach a few life lessons that I learned along the way and hopefully uh, help these kids grow and uh good student athletes. For sure. So you stayed really around that sports scene. Talk a little bit about that uh, first, that FIBA 3X3 and what that is for basketball. Maybe it's something new. Maybe it's something that even people, basketball fans or uh, people in basketball may not know about. So elaborate a little more about what that's about. I know you've had a chance to travel from it. Um, what really is that? For sure, for sure. Yeah, um, so I, I worked uh, with a, a small group of guys, um, Brensley, Haywood, Paris, Kyles, a few other guys, and, and joined a group of Minnesota Paris. Riders. What's that? Paris was on my first pro-am team out when we played yeah. at Indian for Pulley. For sure, for sure. So a lot of great guys, right? And uh, played with those guys uh, for a group called Three Ball Minnesota uh, for a season and, and really fell in love with the game from there. Uh, I ended up moving over to a group uh, called New York Harlem, uh, okay. a great group of guys. They were highly ranked uh, in the world rankings and, uh, you know, having the opportunity to join them and uh, fill out their roster 
uh, gave us the opportunity to travel uh, with the four guys as, as much as possible and compete as, in, as many tournaments as possible. So um, it's, it's really an interesting sport, right? The games are to 21 uh, and the game clock is only 10 minutes. So, you know, if you were to show up at the venue, you could watch 10, 12 games in, in a matter of a few hours when, you know, obviously in the U.S., you're catching a game for, for two hours or so, and then you head out the door. So uh, they're, they're quote from the Greeks to the Olympics, right? So basically it's a new Olympic sport in 2020. And uh, that's why I had, you know, a fantastic opportunity to try out for the USA team uh, in February. Um, unfortunately, uh, it didn't work out the way I wanted, but uh, I was really happy to see that two of my teammates actually made the team. So uh, they they were obviously planning on training for for the games here mm -hmm. um, over the last few months, but with the uh, the Olympics being delayed, um, they won't get to do that yet. But yeah, it's it's a great opportunity to travel around the world, have a lot of fun, and and continue to play basketball uh, with with some really great friends. So uh, I'm just taking it one one day at a time, and 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 we're having a great ride so far. For sure. I, yeah, I like the idea and the con the concept of that spectatorship where you get to see so many games within a short period of time. It reminds me of when the NCAA tournament was here in Minneapolis, went over to Mall of America. I don't know if you saw when Jordan Murphy and some of those guys were playing that three on three, that same concept where we were able to see uh, my girlfriend and her little brother, we were able to see like three or four games and within like a 25 minute span and that's actually really cool just to see all that and i know especially when you get to the international ranks they're just happy to see basketball so to see all that different talent i'm sure is something big um so at the it, end of the day yeah. yeah at the end of the day you know if, if you're in the u.s the nba is here right so it's going to be hard for a sport like that right. to catch on uh you know we've got the best 300 basketball players in the world right mm -hmm. competing in our league. So the second you step outside of the U S uh, head over to Asia, head over to Europe. Um, three X three is life to be honest. Like there are a ton of fans. There are a ton of players. We basically, I wondered what in the world was going on when I started. Yeah. Turns out the best team in the world is from Serbia, right? Because they've been playing for 10 years together. They've, they've learned every single niche to their games and, and they, they pick you apart over time, right, over that 10-minute game period. So, um, you know, it's huge in Europe. Some of the best teams in the world are from there. Uh, you know, there's some great teams from Japan, Mongolia as well. Um, so I just have a lot of fun meeting new people and competing in, in a ton of cool destinations around the world. Yeah, I know. I bet it seems like a cool little concept. I mean, it's a lot of the reason why a lot of guys – even go overseas just to get that uh, feel of being able to see the rest of the world. But then sometimes the actual overseas life is a little different, like where you're actually right. trapped somewhere for like nine months. Because that's something you did right after, right? After, right? You, you started yeah. overseas yeah. life. I realized, I realized very quickly that, uh, you know, spending nine months at a time overseas uh, was not for me. Uh, I definitely uh, planned on settling down with my wife, Aspen, and eventually, you know, we got our, our puppy here, uh, Sully. So, uh, you know, it was important to me that we settled down here in Minnesota. And then obviously uh, I wanted to stay involved in the game. So it yeah. was a lot easier for me to tell Aspen, hey, you know, I'm going to go play in a tournament in Korea for, for five days mm -hmm. instead of, you know, hey, I'm going to go play in France for nine months. You know, it was it was a little bit easier to uh, have that have that uh, blow over. Yeah, for sure. No, I completely understand. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit, man, about some people uh, that might not know before we even get into some gopher talk. I want to talk a little bit about gopher basketball, just about college hoops, um, just going to hoops in general. Uh, we can talk a little bit about. But first. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your path to the Gophers, uh, because, you know, I'm always big on paths to the Gophers, right? Mine was different. Everyone's different. Their path before, after, where they were highly recruited, transfer, whatever it may be. So just talk a little bit about yours um, to the Gophers, how you got there, uh, kind of what that looked like. 
Right, right. Well, I, I suppose my story really started in eighth grade. Um, I played a ton of sports in middle school. I mm-hmm. uh, had the opportunity to kind of spread things out. But by the time I hit eighth grade, I got asked to play for an AAU team called Minnesota Southside. I'd really call us, we, we always joked, we were a bunch of misfits from around the metro area that no other AAU team really wanted. But at the end of the day, when we came together, we were great. So, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity to meet some of my best friends, um, you know, former Gophers like Darren Ha, uh, a ton of other guys who had the opportunity to play in the college ranks just uh, because what Dan Ha and Bill Olson did for us. So a uh, really cool opportunity to, to join a group of guys who, who really didn't have a place uh, except for, uh, you know, together with us. So um, basically it started there. Uh, we, we kind of uh, built our own street cred playing playing pretty tough basketball uh, in, in local tournaments. And then eventually by the time uh, 15U and 16U came around, uh, we had the opportunity to start traveling with a few local sponsorships from uh, some companies uh, in Prior Lake. So uh, we, we felt really fortunate and blessed to have that opportunity to go play in uh, that Super 64 in Vegas. And then, you know, the Jayhawk Invitational, tournaments like that. Um, to me, were really uh, the, the best years of basketball in my life. I, I think uh, the the lack of pressure and the ability to just go out and play the game with your friends uh, was something really special to me uh, and something that I'll really cherish. Uh, from there, obviously, 15, 16 years old, you start creeping up to 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, um, you start getting recruited, right? And, uh, you know, I, yeah, exactly. I you know, fondly remember... What's that? I say exactly. I, I, I finally remember some conversations with, with schools like Santa Clara, South Dakota State, and uh, and Drake, obviously, um, and and kind of found my way to, to Des Moines, right? And uh, thought that was the best fit. I really enjoyed the coaching staff uh, that I was uh, working with during the recruiting process there. Um Obviously, I was attending a ton of Gopher games, but things just never quite got there with uh, Tubby and Ron Jerza, um, who who also were you know amazing along the way. I, I really enjoyed talking to them as well. Um, from there, obviously, played my freshman season at Drake. I uh, was fortunate enough to uh, have a good year and make the all freshman team there. Um, but at the end of the day, with uh, obviously my brother some some illness uh with cancer in the past and then uh my uh i'd call it an urge to just get home at the end of the day uh despite being only you know four hours away uh i really was passionate about uh the idea of coming home and playing at the u yeah and um basically tubby and i had eventually had conversations uh about the possibility of maybe coming back yeah. Uh, but then obviously I think he was removed from the program at some point during my transfer period. And fortunately, uh, obviously Richard was, uh, picked up the phone and gave me a call and, uh, Dan Ha and I went and met with him, uh, in his office and, and basically two days later, maybe three days later, I was committed to the U. So, um, it was always something I was passionate about. I've said it for years, you know playing at the barn was, was a goal of mine since I was a kid. So uh, feeling really blessed that I had the opportunity. And uh, obviously, like I said, the AAU years were some of the best of uh, some of the best basketball we ever played. I think uh, you would speak for it as well, you know, playing in St. Louis and stuff like that. Some of those AAU years uh, we'll never forget. Yeah, for sure. That AAU time, well, when you talk about the tournaments, like, uh, I mean, AU players know that played AU, I would say, from graduated 2000, almost six to about 2013, right, when those tournaments were still hot. Um, because that was the time when the whole kind of shoe circuits kind of took a step back. So that's when, like, the that yeah. Super 64 in Vegas, that was dope. Around the same time, they had that Nike main event. And you talk about Jayhawk Invitational, like from St. Louis, that was like the biggest Midwest tournament was Jayhawk. 
Yep. Right. Back then, that's when all the national stuff was like down in the wild world of sport in Orlando. Right. Uh, you yep. only had like who Williams was like the only known like cool one out there. Minnesota even has some up here, like Hollywood host stuff. Like it was cool stuff back then. But um, we, uh, we had one I remember in the in Minnesota. Jefferson used to be crazy when they would have those pulley and pump and run tournaments. Uh huh. I mean, those were, those were, those were big time for the for the people from Minnesota. So, yeah, definitely know what you're talking about with the Jayhawk. Um, there's a few good ones. Uh, I know AAU Nationals for us was in Clarksville, Tennessee, uh, when we went out there. So, uh, yeah, definitely some great memories of you know packing five guys into the hotel couple guys sleeping on the floor and just finding a way to make it happen so um yeah definitely for sure talk about a little bit well you said you had some guys that played at the college level um from your AU team at the time then you also talked about just guys around minnesota you just said it was a good time jefferson things like that talk about some guys that came out uh when you were playing AU, and then some of those guys that were on your team who were playing around that time for sure obviously you know darren hoff Darren had a, had a crazy path through college, right? He, uh, he started out at Wisconsin Platteville, uh, made his way over to Bethany Lutheran for a year, and then uh, was, with, was with the Gophers here for, for three years. So uh, Darren obviously had a crazy ride, but eventually uh, we, we had the opportunity to play together for a couple of years and, and be roommates for my last year in college. So it all really came full circle for us at the end of the day, you know, having uh, grown up with him and lived with him a lot throughout high school. Um, I had the opportunity to play Division One. Uh, Latrell Love uh, was at Mississippi Valley State, I believe, uh, for a couple of years. Uh, another local guy here, uh, Deshaun Patterson, had the opportunity to to play at uh, a school up in Brainerd, I believe, and then eventually join the Harlem Globetrotters. So. Uh, it was an amazing opportunity for me to kind of follow him. Uh, his, his path has been up and down and he's, uh, he's worked really hard to get where he's at. So, uh, super proud of him as well. I made some incredible friends over the years, Matt Larson from Rosemount, just some really good guys who, you know, some decided to end their, their basketball careers early. Some chased other sports. Uh, you know, everybody's life goes in a, a little bit different direction. Right. So those are a few guys that, that come to mind who, uh, who, who played ball at the next level. And then, uh, obviously, uh, took different career paths along the way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, you're talking about the recruiting time. I know you got to Drake. Eventually you played at Drake. Uh, and then coach Patino ended up picking up the phone. You and Dan Hall had a meeting and you came to a conclusion to come to the Gophers. Talk a little bit about, that process with Coach Patino, as well as really beginning with the Gophers and just playing for Coach Patino. Yeah, you know, it was it, there was a comfort level b between me and Coach P. Maybe it was, you know, what he was 33, 34 years old when we had first met. Right. Yeah. He, he was young. He could relate. Uh, and, and I think we had an instant connection from there. He, he understood my maturity. Uh, right off the bat and kind of, he basically knew what he was getting uh, uh, right off the bat. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I just wanted to come in that first summer, uh, work as hard as I could uh, to make an impact on the program. Uh, it definitely led to a lot of late nights at the barn, right, where you're in there shooting until nine, ten o'clock, uh, just trying to create an opportunity for yourself to get on the court that first year, right? And, uh, you know, me and me and Otto Oceanix went at it right that first summer, just uh, just grinding, trying to uh, create the opportunity to, to, the, to hit the floor by the time the season came around. And so um, a lot of hard work that first summer. Obviously, you and I both remember the. Came along, so uh, <laughs> that definitely led to some hot summers in Beerman working hard and um I think we had a great, great summer leading up to that NIT season. It was a, it was a grind that summer, I say to say the least, right? We had a pretty yeah. rigorous training schedule. Sean Brown, no, no doubt about that. Hey, that's that's the two the two words that come to mind. Sean Brown, 
<laughs> yeah, that was a uh, that was a that was a crazy summer. I mean, you were right there. You were on one of the sides. If people don't know how Sean Brown worked at that time, you you were either overweight or underweight. Yeah. You were one that was seen by Sean Brown as underweight. Myself and a ton of right. other guards were seen as more overweight. And then we were switched halfway through. I know players that were overweight for half their time, ha underweight for half their time. It didn't matter. But no matter what, you were on some sort of schedule. And that was an intense summer. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know where Absolutely. you came from with Drake. Like, how intense was your – for us, even with Tuppy, I mean, our strength coach was Steve Feldy, who it is now. When it came to weighing in, I mean, we weighed in every single day, maybe sometimes twice a day with Sean Brown. Yeah, yeah. For the guys that were for the guys that were underweight like me, and then obviously the guys who were trying to lose some pounds along the way. I mean, there were days where you were weighing in four times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Before practice, after practice after lift and then shoot a manager might come by with a scale at 9 p.m to check on you right so at the end of the day you never know when it was coming um it, i mean as a guy who needed to gain weight eating three chipotle burritos in a sitting i sit there and think about the workouts that we did right so sean brown comes up there's eight weeks in the summer right you go and run the mile that first that first week on that friday morning you run the mile Say a guy runs it in six minutes and 40 seconds, right? And then the next week, Sean Brown comes in and tells all of us, I don't know if you remember, he's like, all right, for the next seven weeks, you need to beat your time. And every single time he had us beat our time until you had Austin Hollins running like a four minute and 40 second mile on that last, on that last weekend. I mean, it was unbelievable. I still remember the uh, the Austin Hollins and Wally Ellenson mile where the, I, I think I ran it in like five minutes and 15 seconds at six foot nine. Wally and Austin were running that thing in like four and a half. Yeah. So, I mean, these guys who are supposed to gain weight are now suddenly, you know, running these five minute miles. It was absolutely unbelievable how difficult that first summer was. That first summer was the hardest thing of all time. I mean, Big Mo, Mo Walker was the first thing I saw my first individual workout, me and Dre uh, and Austin walked in and the bigs did it before us. Like, so the bigs would be either you and all the four or you would be with the five. Sometimes I don't know who was in this group, but Mo was in this group. This was before Mo did his weight loss. It was his first individual workout. You can imagine, because you might not even been there yet. It was still- I wasn't, no, I wasn't. It was, was still when it was the tubby guys, and we walked in because we kind of had a feeling it might be hard. Mo was laying on the ground, and he was supposed to still be running sprints. He, like, couldn't move. And at that point, I was like, oh, man, this might be different. This might be different. But it was different with Coach – and that was before Sean Brown came. And But when Sean Brown came, it was important because Coach P's individuals and his practices – were that demanding that if Sean Brown didn't get us in that shape, we wouldn't have been able to survive. And how much we pressed back then, even compared to how much he presses now, oh, right. we wouldn't have oh, been able to survive. Yeah. It was so many guys think, going to practice. I think we had set the school record for steals or something like that that first season. Yeah, we said I mean, we were, steals. We were moving. It was, it was full court all the time. Right, yeah, and I think it helped. I know – I mean, now I feel like he's a little more – he keeps some of the guys bulkier. Um, but I know back then it was straight, like, just speed, press, run. Um, and I did think it helped, though. That extended season, like, guys were in pretty good shape. Like, from top to bottom, everybody was in very solid shape. And, like, playing teams that we played, like, that Florida State team was solid. Like, there was a solid squad. We had to be in all those guys, so – we were kind of battle tested from that as hard as that first uh, that first summer was. And talking about that time, talking about being Florida State, I'm looking over at the comments from Joe Nelson. We have a question for you. What are your thoughts on the you taking down all the NIT banners inside the barn? Do you have any insight on that, Joey? You being a gopher historian being a part of that, does that affect you as a player? I guess even I want to ask. Uh, 
I mean, I'm not familiar with it. I didn't even know they did, to be mm-hmm. honest. Um, was that this year? It was the you know thing about it. It was like, I think around the Clem Haskins times. Um, and I know a little bit about it. And to that, to that extent, even to how you said that, for me, I think that's unfortunate um, that they take something like that down because, like, that just means, like, me, I didn't know about it until maybe a couple years ago. Reason being, the banner's not up there, so we don't know about them, so we don't see them. So I think it just sucks that they do take those. Oh, from, from, from like, back in the 90s? Back in the 90s. I thought you mentioned they took the 2014. Oh, no, not ours. Not ours. I'm just talking in reference to, our, in, in reference to NIT. You know, not oh, ours. Okay. Ours are still up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, to be honest, that was a little bit before my time, I suppose. Obviously, I learned uh, a little bit about it along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but to be honest, I mean, I'm, I'm not a guy. That wasn't my era. I can't, yeah. I can't really on that. Yeah, that's hard. Of- from a player, you got to understand from a player's perspective, even someone from him being from Minnesota and from someone like me, not even from Minnesota, like, we bleed maroon and gold when we're there and as long as we live. But as far as the history, a lot of that stuff isn't as tied to us. Like, it's just not as deep, right? It's not just ours and some of that stuff. Like, we've kind of had our own development in lives to focus on to get to this point when it comes to basketball. A lot of this stuff has right. been there. Um, but talking about uh, things like that and playing for Coach Patino uh, and playing for the Gophers, uh, what are just some things that stood out to you, whether it's memories, playing for the Gophers, or really just learning times? I mean, you're somebody that came from Drake. Drake is more so a mid-major school. So overall, the talent level should be not as high as a Big Ten school. You came from Drake and you started. You started our first year. So you starting from um a uh, Missouri Valley Conference school and transferring and playing in the Big Ten. Talk about that process a little bit. I mean, a lot of guys nowadays, you know, they might not be getting those looks that right, uh, right away. And so they might need to go that route as opposed to a JUCO route because they had the grades. So it was not that. Or even I'm not sure how in tune you are with the latest go for news. Um they have a guy named Liam Dobbins who's coming from Drake this year as well. Yeah. Uh, talk just a little bit about that process, about what you learned, what came up during those times. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's been interesting seeing, you know, all these all these different college basketball insiders start dropping all this information about how, oh, my oh my goodness, the transfer portal's getting so huge, right? And, hey, you know, mid-major guys transferring to a high-major school, you know, uh-huh. it's not going to work out. And at the end of the day, right, I – I saw an opportunity. I, I loved the academics at Drake, uh, but I was looking for a bigger opportunity at the end of the day. And right. and, tr- and I wasn't going to let myself fail at the end of the day. I was going to go and work as hard as I needed to to make it happen. So coming from Drake, all, all I saw was it was an opportunity, right? I was given the chance to go and compete and, and challenge myself to play at the next level, right? And that's the same thing we did from, you know, going from the Gophers to the professional level, right? Basically, you know, the opportunity to play at Drake was, was a first step, stepping stone for me to make it to the U. Fortunate for me was I was playing against the Missouri Valley that included Doug McDermott, Clay Anthony Early, these, def- these different players that ended up in the NBA, right? The Missouri Valley's has changed a little bit. You don't get the Creightons and the Wichita States anymore who were basically final four wichita state and then obviously any team that's got doug mcdermott when he's the national i think he, he might have won national player of the year i'm not really sure he was nice you know? um, he was just nice everybody knows about him <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> everyone knows yeah. doug but uh yeah having the opportunity to play against you know doug mcdermott mm-hmm. anthony early at the four position you know when i was a freshman in college and those guys are are, you know, I think sophomores, juniors, or seniors. What does the um, give you, 42? No, 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 no. We actually beat Creighton <laughs> when they were ranked. Oh, yeah. We beat them at home. And then, obviously, you know, two weeks later, they were pissed 
and then they took us out in Arch Madness. Uh, so, you know, having the opportunity to play against guys like that, you know, guys who are going to go play at the next level gave me the chance to, you know, step in right away at the U and, and not feel uh, a level or a lack of confidence when uh, you hop on the court against the Aaron Whites of the world, um, you know, Brandon Dawson, Mich Michigan State. Um, th those guys are kind of on level playing fields with, with Doug McDermott, uh, Clay Anthony Early, stuff like that. So it was, it, was a, it was a pretty seamless transition for me because I did feel like the Missouri Valley that year was extremely competitive. Yeah, for sure. Talk a little bit about that transfer portal. It's in the news like you talked about. Uh, this day and age in terms of the transfer portal, in terms of even what potentially might be happening about a kid transferring, they don't have to sit out that one year, right? That might be the potential now. And luckily, um, you know, for you, it wasn't as much that a lot of other things came from that, but even the potential of you not even having to go through waivers or paperwork or anything. How do you feel about that being the the route that the NCAA is headed? Do you think it's something that's going to potentially hurt, help? Should we just kind of at least test it out? What are your thoughts? I, I do think it's going to hurt programs. But at the end of the day, I, I can't sit here and speak for all these kids, right? Everybody's got their own reason uh, to go about transferring. You know, mm -hmm. I had mine, you know, the next guy's going to have his. I think there was even guys like Malik Smith, right? When I joined the team, there's, there's, there were transfers coming in throughout my entire time at the U. Right. Uh, so, so obviously, if, if guys get a free pass and have the opportunity to come and go as they please, um, it, it's going to impact, uh, impact programs in the long run. But I can't really comment and you know make a decision for these kids whether or not it's the, the best move for them at the end of the day. Um, it's, it's a really complicated deal. I know. I know that, you know, that whole summer that we were working as hard as we possibly could to get ready for that 2013-14 season, I didn't know I was going to play. Yeah. I think it was in August or September when, when we were practicing at Williams and, and Coach P brought us to the middle of the court at the end of the practice and said, hey, guys, Joey's eligible. And, you know, obviously we're able to celebrate that as a group, but, you know, I worked my tail off that whole summer not knowing what was going to happen, whether I was going to be red shirting that year. So, you know, having the opportunity to step in and play right away, if that's the, the NCAA wants to go about it, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the world's changing and, and guys are, uh, at least with the transfer portal, they seem to be uh, making a lot more moves uh, than they have in the past. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, let's chat a little bit. Uh, just to round things off here about these current Gophers. Uh, you're over there a little bit uh, behind Coach Patino, still push him uh, along with myself, and sometimes a few other Gophers pop over there. So we've seen a lot of the Gophers since both of us have graduated. Uh, I would fancy us as um, pretty credible fans at this so point. Are we? Are we the super fans? The we were more super fans? super fans. I wish. I wish there was, like, we didn't have a row of bench in front of us if we were really super fans. But maybe I'll figure that out with Caitlin later on. But anyways, yeah, yeah. Uh, work on it. we'll work on it. I say we're super fans at this time. So talk a little bit about this current Gophers roster and this current Gophers team. Um, what you've seen, uh, you know, this year we have Dan Oturu, who has declared for the NBA draft. We also have Marcus Carr, who, you know, he came a little later. Uh, and I think it's really testing um, that whole new rule of testing water. So with the potential of coming back. Um, so talk a little bit about the success you saw with the team just this past year and then where you see this Gopher team uh, going in the future with Patino. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, obviously, at the end of the day for the future, it, it looks like, uh, you know, the opportunity to bring in uh, Robbins and a few of those other guys uh, here. It sounds like there's another – uh, incoming freshman is going to be a good player as well. Um, I, I think the future looks really bright. Uh, you know, personally, selfishly, I'd love to see Marcus Carr back, right? At the end of the day, um, I did think he was electric this season and a, and a lot of fun to watch. I thought he was uh, an extremely steady point guard for us uh, throughout the whole season. 
uh, really gave his teammates confidence along the way. Um, definitely enjoyed watching him play. Obviously, uh, in my opinion, it was a, a no-brainer for Dan to make that decision. Uh, he, he had a fantastic season, and I think he's going to be successful at the next level. Uh, offensively, as a shot blocker, he can do a lot of things. Uh, I loved watching him hit that. As, as a big guy myself, right, I loved watching him step out uh, and not only hit that 15-foot jumper, but he was knocking down some threes throughout the year, too. Uh, so I definitely love to see that as well. Um, other than that, you know, I, I think our role players have a great opportunity to step up next year. Guys like Jarvis uh, would love to see him take the next step. Um, you know, obviously in the low block, uh, we, we all know he can dunk the ball. He can, he can pick and roll. Mm -hmm. um, but the next step for him, right, is, is can he go get a bucket on the low block and, and knock down those free throws as well? So a yeah. uh, great opportunity for him next season to, to step in with a guy who can score on the block like Liam. Uh, and create uh, new opportunities for himself. So uh, right. definitely looking forward to this next season. Obviously, uh, I hope the Corona stuff can pass and uh, look forward to another uh, great year of Gopher basketball. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. That little piece at the end, you hope and the Corona stuff passes. And we were just talking about that. Imagine being an athlete right now, a guy that's just you, maybe being somebody that transferred during this time to the Gophers and like, this time matters like those open gyms right those random i remember when you first came bro we were playing like king of the court we were playing stuff just right away when like daquan mcneil came then we had malik smith we had all you guys just come in and yeah. it like it mattered it wasn't about learning the plays it wasn't about learning tom Izzo in the big 10 it was literally just about building some rapport and learning to play like right away. I knew, I knew right away. Oh shoot. He can kind of shoot the ball a little bit. Let's like, let's play him this way. Right. Oh, he's on my team. Let's leverage him this way. Right. Malik Smith came right. in. I'm like, Oh shoot. Austin and Dre aren't our only shooters anymore. We've got Joey. Now we've got Malik, right. You're learning all the different tendencies. So um, I can't imagine being an athlete right now or a student athlete trying to prepare and trying to step onto campus soon here with, everything we don't even know all the uncertainty I mean, this summertime really matters like being there in the summertime summer school like that's kind of where you really lose weight gain weight pick up the skills all that stuff right i mean we showed up in june and i think i in my opinion right that was the most together group that i played with over my three years there and and i i think a lot of it is contributed that's your first to year that clarify that's your first year uh that you came yeah my first yeah, yeah. yeah that junior year, Austin Hollins, Maverick, seniors. Absolutely. Yeah, that, I mean, that was such a great group of guys where we had the opportunity to bond that first summer uh, with so many incoming new guys, right? Dre Matthew, uh, Daquan, Malik, and myself showing up uh, right in the middle of the summer, uh, right. ready to get started. Um, definitely created the opportunity for all of us to really bond. And, uh, you know, being not not only a returning player into college, but being some of these freshmen from, or, or guys that are going to be leaving Minnesota and going off to play at uh, different schools. You think of guys like Dawson and these and these different players who are heading out of state. I mean, what does that look like with uh, with with the current you know pandemic going on? You know, if they can't get started in June, suddenly every week that passes, and as this stuff gets delayed, you get closer and closer to the season, right? Um, and that's just less time uh, bonding and coming together as a group. Yeah, for sure. And so let's elaborate a little bit on that. Dawson, Dawson, my guy, he can go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about those, not just those guys, those recruits, but let's talk a little bit about a recruitment, Joey. You've gone through recruitment. You've been in the state. You know, you know a lot of the local guys like myself, so you know what they think about when it comes to recruitment. Um, one of the topics a lot lately is in-state recruitment. I mean, Minnesota basketball, as you can see, I've been here since 2011, but I just kind of know the history of it from what you're even talking about, right? You and a lot of guys got recruited, but you probably can agree now, like ever since Tyus, right? There's so many more. They're going to a lot of these bigger schools. I mean, back then you, like you going to Drake was a really big thing during that time. Now so many guys are getting recruited 
but we're seeing a lot of guys not go to the U. That's just the topic of conversation. Um, you being someone at the time that actually decided to go to Drake, whatever may have happened with Coach Smith during that time, but you've been on the other end of it as an in-state recruit. Uh, what are your thoughts about this in-state recruitment thing? Everyone's talking about like the Dawson Garcia, the McKinley Wrights, uh, the J.P. McCurr is even early on. It started leaving early. Um, what are your thoughts about maybe why they're leaving and what can we do as a whole, whether it's the coaching staff or the state, to somehow band together and start keeping those recruits within the state? Or is it just an overreaction and we need to just start recruiting out of state? Um, I, I mean, I, I understand where, where people are coming from with that. When I think back to 2010 to 2012, back uh, uh, in my high school years, um, at the end of the day, it didn't seem like you could go find four or five guys that were going to play at the U, to be honest with you. you yeah. know, it just wasn't a thing. But at the end, and, you know, you'd have, you'd have the Isaiah Zierdens going to Creighton. You'd have Sanjay going to Northwestern. You know, me going to Drake. There were a ton of great basketball players. Siani going to Harvard, right? A ton, a ton of great basketball players. But at the end of the day, you know, even when I showed up at the U two years later, I think I spent that whole season as the only Minnesotan on the team, to be honest. I think, I think once Joe Coleman left, I was the only Minnesotan on the team. So, Ooh. I mean – in-state recruitment at the end of the day minnesota i think wasn't on the map as much from a basketball perspective back then you know you've seen minnesota blossom into a place where you're having top five recruits in the country um and that has that has been a definite change in the last 10 years uh to the point where the the talent pool of players has really grown and and you're seeing you know at the end of the day, what, call it 20 high major guys, the, the University of Minnesota is not going to be able to keep them all in state. Uh, the, the goal would be finding the guys that fit your program best at the end of the day. That's what I've always been about is finding guys who are the right fit. To me, I don't care about finding the most talented guy out on the court. It's, it's just not my thing. I'm looking for the guys that are going to fit the mold of our program the best. That's just my perspective. No, understandable. So it's really not more so looking for those top five recruits always in the state. If they don't fit being in state or not, it doesn't matter if they don't fit. It's just it's just not there. Um, talking a little bit about that, and you fancy yourself as this. I mean, I had a conversation with you. I had a conversation with every teammate I had about your game, about where you came from. Uh, and right away, I mean, you're the way you play – you wear your game on your sleeve. You're a hard-nosed guy. You're not going to be the most athletic guy on the court. You're not going to be the fast guy on the court, but you're going to probably outwork everybody on the court. That's just how it is. That's how you play the game, and I think that's probably how you separate yourself, and that's probably why you, being a coach now, you look for guys that are just going to do everything needed to make a team win. Um, talk a little bit about that as a player, maybe more so even when you got recruited and getting recruited as someone that isn't the most athletic guy, somebody that can't really, I say trick coaches. A lot of guys trick coaches where they're just athletic, they can dunk, but they just don't really know the game. Talk about how you were able to separate yourself and get recruited as a player. Maybe more advice even for players that are in your position that might not be that most athletic guy, but they did everything right on the court. They focused in on getting a knockdown jump shot. What are those types of things that players can do? Uh, and get recruited and separate themselves. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, my my shooting coach back when I was a kid, he was my AAU coach as well, Bill Olson. He always told yeah. me from day one uh, that shooting was going to be the golden ticket for me. Right. So, you know, obviously, you know, having the opportunity to set the free throw record for, mm -hmm. for the U and stuff like that, it, it proves that I put a ton of time in uh, into shooting the basketball and then Obviously, my goal was always to extend that to the three-point line so I could, you know, whether I ended up being a five, a four, a three in college, no matter what, I was going to be able to stretch the defense. And, you know, fortunately, uh, it ended up being a great position for me, playing with guys like Nate and Dre Matthew, uh, having, having the opportunity to be a stretch four, fit my game really well offensively. So basically, you know, 
had, had a great time playing with those guys, having the opportunity uh, to kind of take my place within the team. I, I, I think of myself as a guy who never tried to do too much at the end of the day. Uh, I went in, I did my job, I was effective at it, and uh, basically tried to create as many opportunities to win as, as physically possible, whether that was diving off the court, taking charges, it, it really didn't matter to me. And Kendall, I will mention I was a decent athlete in high school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're pretty decent, Dan, I'm sure. Well, you probably... It's, it, is very, it, is very, it is very difficult to stay athletic when you go from 195 pounds to 245 pounds. <laughs> well, that's, that's true, too. And, I mean, we're playing against the top athletes in the world. I mean, you're playing against four men that are all NBA draft picks when you talk about Big Ten players anyway, too. So, I am comparing you to that as opposed to I'm sure you were dunking everybody in high school. <laughs> But no, that um, no, that's good advice for anybody looking to play and anybody that's in that position for you. Just honestly giving it all and giving your all to win. I think that's what happens. I think that's how you get playing time. If you're looking for a scholarship from high school, heck, if you're in college and you're looking for a scholarship, that's what you got to do. You got to do those types of things uh, just to separate yourself uh, and set yourself apart. But yeah, you know, being, being, a, being a sponge and and honestly being the most coachable guy on the floor will, will create opportunities for you at the yeah. end of the day. I mean, that's that's really what I did. I, I I stayed out of trouble, did my job, was as coachable as possible. And and, you know, that's why you got guys like Coach Patino, you know, every few months. You, oh, you know, Joey, he was one of the most coachable guys. I And that's why that's what really makes you likable. Uh, from a coaching perspective is, is as long as you're not, you know, creating any problems or drama, um, it's, it's a pretty easy path. Yeah, for sure. Well, before we, uh, before we go here, last piece, we talked about Liam Dobbins a little bit earlier, but I know that's the guy a lot of Gopher fans are excited for, uh, a guy I plan to connect with soon here too. Uh, So you being somebody, I mean, don't know anybody in more of a similar position, uh, for you uh, besides uh, that, but talk a little bit about what advice, you know, you would have for somebody like him coming in, uh, playing that style to play in this style. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I, I was able to check him out a little bit. Uh, some highlights from, from March, uh, Arch Madness and stuff like that. Uh, it looks like he's got a, a good back to the basket game at the end of the day. He's, he's got, he's got a wide body, uh, a great opportunity to, to rebound and score the basketball in the big 10. Uh, he's obviously got the size to do it. Um, obviously conditioning will always be one of the biggest things with coach Patino. He'll, he'll want guys running the floor, similar to Dan, um, I'm looking forward to his opportunity at the end of the day. You know, it's funny. I think about him, right, and how I transitioned from, you know, eating at the dining halls at Drake and stuff like that. And and he's he's going to have his life do a complete 180, right, joining, joining the U and having all these new opportunities uh, presented to him. You know, obviously, I, I felt like the guy, and you may as well, right, we're always the, okay, is the practice facility coming, guys, right? Yeah. So the second I left Drake, they built a practice facility and then you and I graduate. Right. And then all of a sudden athletes village comes around. I mean, you know, what an opportunity these guys have to, to compete and practice in a place like that. Um, I, I feel really happy for them. And, and, you know, even the chance for us to go around and tour, tour the facilities is, is pretty unbelievable. For sure. For sure. Well, let's finish with the last question that was sent in. Best goal for experience? Is it the winning the NIT or is it Darren Hall hitting that jump shot? Uh, what is it? A tough call. So when Darren, one of my proudest moments was was seeing uh, Darren hit that jump shot against Illinois in there. It was cool for me to be able to be out there playing with him. Uh, but my foot was snapped in half. So that was a bit of a bummer. Oh, yeah, um, uh, but yeah. One of the most entertaining moments for us, I think, as a group was when we won that NIT and had the opportunity to, uh, you know, celebrate in the locker room. And that happened to be the the night that I ended up meeting my wife as well. So that's uh, that's <laughs> she was a cheerleader for us at the U. So 
that's a crazy situation and story that I get to tell all the time as well. You know, being a sophomore, I was, I was the only guy that couldn't get into the bars in New York. I was 20. So had the opportunity to meet Aspen in New York. So you took um, full advantage of what you could do at that time. And that story is yeah. a lot better. A lot of, I mean, I feel like New York was a great time for us. And I enjoyed yeah. it, but absolutely. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's good though. That yeah, that's a real good story. But I say NIT. I mean, oh, why well, hell? I feel like everything was so fun as well. I I'd have to say Warner. It's two for me. It's always gonna be two, and I can say two because it's not fair. Right before you came, we beat Indiana when they were number one, and yeah. then we beat we won the NIT. And I really can't think of two better experiences. But yeah, going out in New York after that though. It was, and it was important for us to, to celebrate that because at the end of the day, we had, I think it might've been uh, Penn State. Um, and then before that, we had a tough loss uh, in, the la in the last few seconds to Northwestern, which is what held us out of the tournament that year. And at the end of the day, we, we needed something to celebrate because, you know, heading into the NIT when we played High Point, St. Mary's, Southern mm -hmm. Miss at home, you, you could see we're a little bit frustrated with ourselves. Oh, but, so mad. <laughs> um, you know, once once we got to once we got to New York and had the opportunity to you know catch up with Florida State again and then uh, play SMU, I think uh, it was a lot of fun and, and great great teams obviously to compete against, but uh, you know made victory that much sweeter. Yeah, it's pretty. It's very important to for as a coach. And as players to figure out a way to rally together when you go through such disappointment, but then you have right. such a potential big goal. And what Coach Patino was able to do as far as, I mean, and it was all real, show us the potential plan in New York and Madison Square Garden, putting that as a goal. Um, it, it was it was a good and fun thing to go after. We had a really good time doing it. But I remember that year we were technically the number one seed of that NIT in the whole tournament. So we're the first ones out of the tournament. So it's like, what do you cheer on at that time? Like being that, I mean, that is that is as heartbreaking as it gets. As heartbreaking as it gets. So we had to really go through that. I know we had some tough, interesting games uh, to start for that NIT, but we ended up rallying, rallying together. Got out of there. It was a, it was a good time. I knew, we're, I, I knew we were going to win the tournament we're, when we were down 14 to zero to St. Mary's oh. and we ended up, we ended up coming back. I was like, yep, we're going to win this tournament. Yeah. I was, I was a little worried at first about this St. Mary's game. They had the big man, I think like the guy that right. was a little, uh, yeah, we know we, we got through that. We had a really good squad. I mean that my junior year that year, which is that year, and then the year right before, like I had two really really good teams, so sack, so talented. Um, yeah. So it was a good, it was a good thing. One more quick, one more question. I promise this is the last one. I want to hear right. this one from you, as from Eric Gage. Uh, ultimate question of the NIT tourney, and this is true because I kind of saw it the other day and I forgot about it. I haven't really oh, seen any of the games, but up three. Do you foul or do you not foul on defense? <laughs> what do you say, Joy? Because that's well, we, the, we gave we we gave up the three, didn't we, to go to overtime? Yeah, that's what the announcers were talking about. I think I don't know if Coach Patino was for it and his dad was against it or what, but both were on different sides. Him and his dad, right. Patino. And then we get in. <laughs> Gage just texted me about it now. <laughs> But uh, at the end of the day, yeah, um, I think I think someone was well, someone was saying foul, someone was saying no, and then we got to the SMU game the next uh, few days later, and everyone was like, "Yes, foul." Yeah. <laughs> After they hit that shot to go into overtime. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I'm definitely going with foul then. I'm definitely going with foul as well, because like, I mean, and that's because you're confident in your own free throw shoot. Like, I'm going with foul. Like, fine, get it. They miss it. At the worst, they'll make it, and we're gonna get fouled and go make two free throws as well. As long as, as long as I can. As go long as yours, you need to at least have. For us, we always had. What I learned from being on that Gopher team is always have at least two knockdown free throw shooters on the floor. Because you and Dre Hollins, I always didn't worry about, and. We always right. had an opportunity for one of you actually literally to get the ball. Like at the end of the game, it was always 
and when that happened, I mean, that won us. That, that got us to where we were at. So that was a good time. Lesson to kids, to wrap everything up, shoot your free throws. All right. Well, appreciate your time, Joey. Thanks for talking today. Thanks for answering Gage's question about uh, fouling or not to foul him. But appreciate you, and uh, good luck with everything going forward, man. Kendall, thanks for having me, and appreciate all the Gopher, Gopher fans tuning in. Thank you. Yes, sir. Have a good one.